Imagine for a second that your phone suddenly loses service. What would you do? You might try turning your data off and then turning it back on again. If that doesn't work, you might even try turning the phone off, giving it a second, and then powering the entire device back on. It's a trick that solves nearly every problem, but it doesn't solve this one. You can't call your phone service provider because you have no service, and it's too late to go to a retail store as they've all closed. So you let the situation sit, hoping it's just a problem with the cell tower and you go to sleep. The next day, you still don't have service. When you get to the store, the sales clerk tells you your phone was reported stolen. We ported the number over to a new SIM card yesterday. But you've had your phone in your possession the whole time, so that couldn't be true. Unless somebody stole your phone number. Once you get it back and get your service running again, you get a flood of emails. All the passwords to your most important accounts have been changed. Any cryptocurrency you had is now gone. You have messages from family and friends confirming that they sent money to you to an unrecognized bank account. This is the absolute worst case scenario in a hack called simjacking. Simjacking doesn't have to be as devastating as this example might imply, but there's one thing that shouldn't be overlooked. Phone numbers were never meant to be used as a method of authentication. Phone numbers were never intended to be secure. They were never intended to be passwords or to be used for authentication. It's almost as if nobody told us, don't ever give out your cell phone number because it's more valuable than your social security number or your passport number or your mother's maiden name. But it is. If there's one thing cybersecurity experts agree on, it's that phone numbers are important. More important now than they've ever been. Because they weren't always so important. Before cell phones, most households had only one landline per residence. But when cell phones came around, everything changed. Phone numbers became individualized. That individualization meant that a phone number could be more than just a phone number. In the late 90s, phone numbers started being used as identification. There's been this migration towards, well, then this number is associated with a person, so it can identify them. And then from that identifying, we've sort of migrated, oh, we can authenticate the user based on if they have this phone number or access to this phone number. And really, the technology was never intended for that way, and that's part of the problem. And truth be told, it wasn't really a problem in the late 90s. It was functional convenient and mostly secure because our phones were just that, phones. But now our phones are like magic rectangles that we run our whole lives out of. Online banking, social media, health insurance, anything you can think of, there's an app for that. It's incredibly convenient. But if things are too convenient, that means they're probably vulnerable to being hacked. So the security field introduced two-factor authentication. One-factor authentication is using a password that hopefully only you know to log into an account. More secure than no factors, but generally not that secure since the most used passwords in the world are still extremely simple with 123456-11111 and password being the most common. So to make it doubly secure, you can use two-factor authentication. Think about when your bank wants you to secure your online banking account, what do they do? They send you a code. Where do they send it? They send it to your phone number. And while 2FA is oftentimes linked to our phone number, the problem is bigger than that. Many accounts allow you to sign in or authorize password resets with your phone number alone. Generally speaking, two-factor authentication is still multitudes more secure than just using a password. But as the terrifying opening scenario implies, our phone numbers are much more vulnerable to being hacked than you might expect. A lot of times people think you need to be very technically gifted, you don't. What criminals are essentially doing is tricking the phone provider into switching your phone number to a phone that they control so that your calls, your text messages go to their phone instead of to yours. Then they can receive your one-time password text messages. They can receive your reset password messages. They can receive all your messages. 
To do this, hackers have to impersonate you, and it isn't always that difficult. Though it's been cracked down on, one proven method for hackers to do this was to go to a third-party vendor. These stores make money on the phones people buy, which gives them a monetary incentive to switch over a SIM card. Hackers say they lost their phone and need to port their number over to a new one that they're looking to buy. This has become less prevalent as phone companies have become aware of this hack. However, the same basic principle applies if a hacker were to go to their local AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, or any other phone provider. This is a bit trickier as they might ask for more verifying information, but with a fake ID and a little knowledge, a hacker could facilitate a SIM port. In some cases, this may be difficult if the person has password protected the account, which many cell phone providers have begun doing. But if you don't have a password set up, this could be a piece of cake. That said, the phone companies have a problem, which is what happens if your phone is stolen and you do need to reset it, right? They need to have a way of making it not too cumbersome and of having ways to deal with the fact that if somebody forgot their password and had their phone stolen, that you know, that they're able to get their phone number back. Uh, and those are some of the things that criminals exploit. Once they own your number, they own you. And that is really, really challenging. It's like basically a digital walk-in on your life. Which means your bank account, your social media, everything is up for grabs. And not just for you, but for any contacts in your phone too, as they might reach out to them. People that say, you know, my life is boring and if somebody wants to like jump into my life, they're gonna be bored and fall asleep. I say, well, understand everyone, every device, every account, every individual is now considered an attractive commodity to cyber criminals. And it may not be about you. People don't just look at you, they look at your circle of trust, they look at where you work, they look at who you're connected to. And even if you think, well, three degrees away from me, we're just nobodies. It doesn't matter. Everything can be commoditized and sold on the dark web marketplace to be used for other things. In the last few years, SIM jacking attacks have targeted people within the crypto space. A reporter at TechCrunch who didn't have an exorbitant amount of crypto was still a victim of SIM jacking. Luckily, he didn't lose any money, but it wasn't for lack of trying on the hacker's part. The hacker changed all of his passwords. Then they reach out to the reporter's friends and family, seeking 10 Bitcoin to help pay for an emergency surgery with the promise of sending 15 Bitcoin back the next day. The reporter only fell victim to this hack because somebody he knew was attacked first and that hacker reached out to him. Once he admitted to having cryptocurrency, they saw him as the next target. But physical money isn't the only motive for targeting you could have other valuable commodities that can be sold for money. It's become commonplace to SimJack in order to steal social media handles. The most sought after handles are the simple ones. The one word ones with no numbers, underscores, or periods. These usernames can be flipped online at a site called ogusers.com for thousands of dollars. Gimlet's Reply All reported on a story where a woman got her Snapchat account hacked because the username was Lizard. The hacker was a teenager who was still living with his parents. He and his friends were pulling off multiple attacks on anyone with OG usernames. In this case, the attacker didn't steal any money from her directly and was focused on just getting her username. But not all hackers are going to be so focused on just one method of attack. And what people need to realize is, is there's oftentimes cyber criminal syndicates could be individuals working together to pull off a heist of multiple SIM swapping attacks. While all that seems pretty scary, there are a lot of things you can do to protect yourself. One of the easiest ways is to password protect the account you have with your cell provider. That way, any moves you make needs to be authorized with a special phrase first. Besides that, if you've already given out your cell phone number, you don't have to move to burner phones for the rest of your life. There are things you can do that dramatically improve the multi-factor authentication. In many systems, instead of sending you one-time passwords by text messages, they let you set a, run an app on the phone, either Google Authenticator or some other uh, apps that generate one-time passwords every minute. 
that is bound to the phone. So even if a criminal were to steal your phone number, they would not be able to simply generate that one-time password. It's not being sent to them. The other thing to be thinking about is, think about the email accounts that you use and to think about having multiple versions of those. So you want to have one that you only use with your bank account, no place else. One with social media that you don't use any place else. That way, if for some reason an attacker has one email account and your cell phone number and they're trying to trick you, they can only get to one type of account. They can't get to your whole life and start locking you out of your whole life. The other thing to be thinking about is having burner numbers. So you can sign up for a free service like Google Voice or Talkatone and there's others and you can get a phone number. And when somebody says, what's your cell phone number? That's the number you hand out and you forward that number over to your cell phone. I've been of the opinion, uh, somewhat controversial opinion, that people should not regularly change their passwords. I would say the same thing with the phone number. The more times you change things, the more mistakes occur, the more times people need to remember things, and human factors become a bigger and bigger problem. And the reality is that when it comes to data breaches and all sorts of cybersecurity nightmares, human factors are the number one cause, with no close number two. The other thing I would say is, Security is hard and that stinks. And that's on the security industry. We have to change that. And I agree, like we, the model is broken. You spend a lot of money on smartphones. You spend a lot of money on this technology. And yet the burden of protecting your own privacy and security is on you. That's wrong. But unfortunately that's where we are. Simjacking can be devastating. But before you think about all the ways you can prevent yourself from being a victim to it as listed here, all the cybersecurity experts I spoke to emphasize that you shouldn't even begin to think about burner numbers or multiple emails if you don't have the basics down. Strong passwords, antivirus software, and a keen eye for not clicking on suspicious links, among other general cyber hygiene methods. Now, I know what you're asking yourself. Is this a hack that you really need to be concerned about for yourself? Well, the other thing I would say about SIM swapping is it's still a little bit more sophisticated and hard to pull off at massive scale, but it is happening. You know, it used to be ransomware was very difficult to pull off. Now it's super simple. You can actually do ransomware as a service. And so it's only a matter of time before cyber criminal syndicates say, you know, the SIM swapping thing, it makes us a lot of money. We should spend some development time, some R&D time on really making this simple for us to do. It's still a fairly rare occurrence compared to other types of cyber crime, like identity theft and fraud and account takeovers, but it's just a matter of time because it's going to be one of the more lucrative payoffs. So it's gonna be worth our time spending time on it. If you made it this far, thank you so much for checking out this video. Make sure to like and subscribe. It really helps us out in creating awesome content like this. If you're looking for more nuance, we've left some links in the description below for the articles that we use when researching this video.